Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Assembly Judiciary. We'd like to welcome everyone here in Carson City, as well as those watching in Las Vegas or watching online through the legislative um, YouTube or Nellis. With that, Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Constantine. Present. Assemblywoman Gallant. Present. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Assemblywoman Hardy, Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch, Assemblywoman Marzola, Here. Assemblywoman Mosca, Here. Assemblywoman Newby, Here. Assemblyman Orentlicker, Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, Present. Assemblyman Urich, Here. Chair Miller. Here, and please mark Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch present when she arrives. Just a few reminders, please everyone turn off um, the volume on any of your electronic items that can cause noise. Also, information about today's meeting is avail available on Nellis, including the phone number to call in because we will have a public comment section at the end of today's uh, meeting. Today we, and also just a reminder, anytime that you're presenting any exhibits you need for your bills, please make sure you have them in by 12 p.m. the day before. With that, today we have three bills that we're hearing, and we will hear them in order according to the agenda. Assembly Bill 14, Assembly Bill 55, and Assembly Bill 67. Our first bill today, I will open the hearing on, we will be hearing Assembly Bill 14. It's a me This measure revises provisions relating to the state business portal. We have, I believe, our Lieutenant Governor and our Secretary of State that are both here to present together. So whoever's presenting, I would like to welcome you both up to the table. And if you have any additional. And it's an honor to have you both in front of us today. So welcome. Lieutenant Governor, I believe this is your first day presenting in front of us. First time in judiciary? It is, and you all look very friendly, so uh, I'm glad <laughs> look, to see Looks that. may be <laughs> deceiving. <laughs> so whenever um, you are ready, please proceed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, uh, my name is Stavros Anthony. I am the Lieutenant Governor for the State of Nevada. I'm here this morning to testify in support of Assembly uh, Bill 14. Uh, my predecessor, Lieutenant Governor Lisa Cano Burke, had requested this bill. After reviewing the bill language and understanding that this bill is needed to help ease the burden on small businesses, I am pleased to help advance this legislation this session. Uh, if passed, the Office of the Secretary of State will serve as a clearinghouse for general business license applications and renewals. Regulatory authority and licensing revenue streams would remain untouched and under the purview of the counties and municipalities. Should this bill become law, business owners applying or renewing a general business license will go to the Secretary of State's office or visit its website, submit required information, and pay all necessary fees and licensings. As many of you are aware, my office oversees the Office of Small Business Advocacy. This office has talked with many small businesses who have expressed the need to make the licensing process less confusing and burdensome. Our hope is that this bill will make the startup process easier for small businesses while not taking revenue or authority away from local governments. I'm very pleased to work with the Secretary of State, Cisco Aguilar, on this uh, legislation. We both share a desire to help small businesses succeed in the state of Nevada. Uh, in addition, um, I want to very much stress that uh, during this process of this pa bill is passed, the Secretary and I Secretary of State and I are committed to having a, a working group constantly in touch with what we're doing. Uh, that working group would include uh, all the stakeholders that are involved in this particular bill, and that could be uh, cities, counties, uh, chambers of commerce, anyone that wants to be involved in making sure that this process succeeds and, and uh, uh, helps small businesses but does not impact anything that the city or counties uh, will be doing. So we, we are committed to making sure that they are constantly involved at the table while we're working this process through. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to the uh, Secretary of State, and then uh, obviously I will be happy to answer any questions uh, when you're ready, Madam Chair. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Miller and members of the committee. I'm Francisco Aguilar, Secretary of State. I'd like to thank the Lieutenant Governor for having me here with him today. I worked with his predecessor on the idea behind this bill, and I'm excited that he wanted to keep the conversation going. I've said countless times, no one should have to hire an attorney to start their own business. The goal of this legislation is to streamline the process for business owners and entrepreneurs, even if it makes things a little bit more complicated for governments. We're here to serve them, not the other way around. In an ideal world, an entrepreneur would be able to go to the Secretary of State's website, begin the process of creating their new corporation or LLC, obtain their state business license, and then immediately be able to pay for their local licenses as well. We know this is more complex than it sounds at first. I'm grateful to the representatives of our cities and counties for reaching out to discuss what this process could look like. But from what I've heard from small business owners and chambers of commerce around the state, this is a direction we need to move immediately. As the Lieutenant Governor said, we welcome the participation of local governments, chambers and business owners, and a working group to help us drive the implementation of this bill. It's important to get this done right, especially given Silver Flume's reputation, and I apologize. Later on this week, I'll be presenting my office budget to the legislature, and a key component of that budget is a 15 million one-shot request to dramatically upseat the process of fixing Silver Flume and building towards an eventual replacement. The passage of this bill would give us a target to hit, a unifying goal for state and local governments. In my opinion, it's moving towards a one-stop shop makes sense for Nevada's future. It's what Silver Flume was intended to be, even if things didn't work out along the way. I'm confident that given enough time and collaboration, collaboration, we can come up with a solution that works for business owners, takes pressure off our municipalities while still driving and delivering revenue, and gets us where we want to be as a state. Just because the Secretary of State's office suffers from a technology deficit does not mean we shouldn't be planning for the future of our small businesses. Our small businesses are our communities, and they are the future of this state. Thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, then um, we will begin with questions from the members. Our first question comes from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you. Thank you for being here, gentlemen. It's nice to see uh, bipartisan legislation coming right out the gate, so I appreciate that. Um, I noticed that the, um, the bill is going into effect next July, which I'm imagining is because you're going to have that working group uh, working on what that's going to look like. Can you tell me <clears throat> exactly the breakup of that working group and, and how often do you think they're going to meet um, and uh, you know, what, what is that going to look like? in your mind? That's a great question, and uh, we haven't actually uh, set that up yet. So uh, we, we haven't talked about how often we're going to meet. We haven't talked about who's going to be in the working group. Uh, we haven't gotten that far yet, uh, but we will be doing that. Um, I don't know how often we're going we're gonna to meet, but we will meet on a regular basis. But we just haven't gotten that far yet. Again, Stavros Anthony, for the record. Next question from Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. <clears throat> With this integration, um, I am concerned about the additional requirements at the state level or at the local level. Uh, things like the planning and zoning conformance, things like fire inspections, things like uh, license uh, adherence um, by the business, um, and not to mention, of course, privilege licenses. Um, how is this uh, system, as you define it or conceptualize it, going to incorporate all of those aspects, not from just one local jurisdiction, but from what, 17 counties and however many incorporated cities? Madam Chair, through you to Assemblywoman Newby. Cisco Please go Agu direct. Okay, Cisco Aguilar for the record. That's a great question and it's a conversation that I've actually had with the Henderson Chamber and the City of Henderson representatives is bringing up some of those issues and trying to understand some of the complications of a one-stop shop. <clears throat> I think what it is too is an opportunity for business owners to know that this requirement exists I see it as a positive rather than a negative in those challenges. 
and it's something for us to have to figure out through the system. But I think, especially when you think about our rural counties, there are a lot of times they don't have the systems and processes to collect these revenue opportunities, and this will only make the business owner or business entrepreneur understand that this fee exists and actually collect it because they don't know how to process it from the very beginning as a business owner. So the answer is we need to determine how to deal with these zoning issues, and it is a good question and a great question, and understand it. Thank you for your question. Our next question is from Assemblyman Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, just a quick question. Is there going to be any uh, financial burden placed on the local, uh, you know, especially the rural counties, that, you know, to you know, integrate the system into what they've got going now? Assemblyman Gray, I do not see this. I actually seen it as a net benefit to the counties, and that's my goal. My goal is not to create additional burden on the local governments or an additional cost. I see it as a technology efficiency. Next question from Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair Miller. Good to see you both this morning. Um, I certainly can appreciate this working with Silver Flume for many, many years with my own business, trying to renew licenses and your um, LLC and all those things. It can sometimes, even with someone that's quite familiar with it, it, it was sometimes challenging. So I, I think this is a great idea, and I just want to make sure that on the record that we're understanding um, what it will uh, potentially be doing. So if you're going in and you're applying for a business license um, in Las Vegas or Henderson, depending on the type of business, you would be able to see just what you said. Do I need a Clark County license? Do I need a city license? Because sometimes that's the hardest thing of, depending on the business, what license do I need to be applying for? Um, and so is, is that correct? They would be able to go one place, see what they need, and be able to apply for it and pay for it all in one place. Assemblywoman, thank you for your question. Cisco Aguilar, for the record, absolutely correct. My envisioning is you would go to the website, put in your zip code or the location of your business. It would prompt up what jurisdictions you have to deal with or what requirements are required of you as a business owner, and then lead you directly to those departments without you having to run around to three different locations to figure out what you need to do to be compliant. I think some of the nuances of understanding zoning issues, safety issues, fire issues can be dealt with I mean, you look at the way we file our taxes these days, you look at TurboTax, it guides you through every single step, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory about how these things will work. Thank you for that question. Um, we have a question from Assemblywoman Summers, uh, Summers Armstrong. Good morning, and thank you both for being here um, and talking to us about this legislation. Would you be interested uh, or open to phasing um, this project. Um, this is huge, and um, we've had some kerfuffles in the past with um, IT projects, and I think it might not be a bad idea to consider starting um, smaller and then uh, growing this after you've um, figured out all the, uh, the ins and outs. Uh, Cisco Aguilar, for the record, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, thank you for that because it's exactly our intent. The Lieutenant Governor and I have had that conversation, especially given the current condition of Silver Flume. We have to make sure the Silver Flume is strong and that base is really able to handle this type of system. Also, given some of the conversations with local governments, they have some great concerns, and I would be too if that was my responsibility. And we have to have those conversations. We have to work through the issues that Assemblywoman Newby raised to order to make this work properly for both sides of the table. Proceed. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, um, the IT project that you're in talking about undergoing, do you have folks inside your organization that have the expertise um, to work with your contractor um, who have ex expertise in coding and, and tables and all the stuff that you're going to need um, and the software and, and just designing a program? to help you, or are you going to be relying primarily on outside contractors? Uh, Cisco Aguilar, for the record, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. It's a great question. Thank you, because that's something we've been struggling with to make sure that we have the talent within the Secretary of State's office, especially within the Silver Flume portal, 
division. We do, we have Paul, who's with us. He's our deputy. We also have a strong IT team. But in addition to that, we have a vendor who's been working with the current system to get it to function on a daily basis. And the updates, they, I believe they're on update number four, and each of those updates has gone well over the last two months. We're impressed with their work that they have been able to take a system that has not been able to function and make it function for our business community. The other is that we are bringing on a third party. Gartner will work with us for the implementation. They do well with large system implementations. Uh, you know, coming from the construction industry, you in most of those projects you have what's called an owner's rep. They hold both the owner, which would be our office, and the IT firm accountable for deliverables and making sure we're meeting expectations, but also, too, we're getting what we paid for out of the vendor. Thank you for that. And um, our last question is from Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, when I heard your presentation, it made me think of a shopping center in um, Henderson that's half in Henderson and half in the county. Um, and so, so this would be very helpful for those um, for those businesses in, the, in that shopping center because some of them don't even know until they move in that this is an issue for them. But can this? Can this project be used to also educate the, the business owner so that they understand those issues that they might have where it's not just that they come in and they register and they get everything they need done, but they're also kind of made aware that, you know, where they're supposed to be going in the future and which entities they're supposed to be dealing with? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, that's a great question. I, I think that's going to be, uh, again, Stavros Anthony for the record. Uh, that's going to be a big part of uh, my office, Office of Small Business Advocacy, is being out there and educating people about um, about this new process that we're putting together, about uh, where to go. That's going to be a big part of my office's responsibility to make sure we, we educate people on we have a new system. It's easier to use. This is where you go. Um, you can take care of business very quickly, and uh, I think that'll be a positive. Thank you. Um, with that, I would like to open it up for testimony, and then I will call you both back up at the end for your final remarks. So those who would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 14, please approach the table. Again, everyone will be allowed up to two minutes. Please make sure that you say and state your name clearly for the record. And whenever you are ready, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the Vegas Chamber. As the state's largest and broadest business organization, the Chamber is in support of AB 1-4. We appreciate the intent of the bill that creates and offers a more streamlined business licensing process that operates a business-friendly man manner through integration. We view the state and local governments as partners in a, sorry, <clears throat> and as partners and we believe that their input will be integral in this process. As an organization that serves small businesses, our members are always seeking systems that will provide greater efficiency and understanding with local and state requirements. Eight, almost 84% of the Vegas Chamber members are small businesses, which we define under a total of 50, empl 50 employees. Here are some items that businesses are typically looking for with their licensing process. A business licensing system that is secured, a simple process for identifying the forms, registrations, licenses, permits, tax payments, and other filings that they require to submit, a, cu a customer-oriented process, and they want their voice to be heard in the decision-making process. In addition to proposed policy changes in AB 14, the Chambers also will be supporting a separate request by the Secretary of State to overhaul and upgrade Silver Flume to better serve Nevada businesses and entrepreneurs this session. Thank you for your time and consideration, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Connor Kane with Career Nevada, testifying on behalf of the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, also known as LVGEA. LVGEA supports AB 14 and thanks the Secretary of State and the Lieutenant Governor for bringing the proposal forward. LVGEA believes a conversation to streamline how businesses can acquire a business license enables the state to, to become more economically competitive and for that reason finds itself in support of the bill. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 14? Okay, is there anyone in Las Vegas who would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 14? 
Okay, broadcasting, I'd like to open the phone lines for anyone who would like to testify in support. Those who are listening, our phone number is 1-669-900-6833. And the meeting ID is 847-322-80317. So broadcasting, please open the lines. Sure, the public line is open and available, but there are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Then I will close testimony and support and open testimony in opposition. If there's anyone that would like to approach and oppose Assembly Bill 14. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Rogan, J-E-F-F-R-O-G-A-N, and I'm here on behalf of Clark County today testifying in limited opposition to AB 14, and I want to stress limited opposition. Clark County, and specifically our business license in Clark County, uh, Clerk, we support removing or limiting um, administrative burdens to businesses so that they can operate more smoothly and obtain their business licenses more efficiently, as well as all their other permits and payment of fees. Our concerns with this bill are limited to two. The first you've heard, and that's technological. Silver Flume is a huge problem for the county. We often have people coming into the county ready and willing to obtain their business license, but they can't because Silver Flume is down and they can't obtain their state registration. Our second concern is really definitional. We don't really understand what is meant by integration. For example, today we heard testimony about integrating zoning processes into this application. That is not clear from this bill. And so we need further clarification as to the extent and the understanding of what integration means before we can move away from opposition. But we're, we're happy to work in this working group that the Secretary of State and uh, the Lieutenant Governor are, are putting together, and we definitely want to be a part of that process. And I think that we could move away from opposition as long as some of these concerns are addressed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Stephen Wood, representing Carson City. Um, we appreciate the intent of AB 14 and appreciate the Secretary of State and Lieutenant Governor's Office and uh, their work on this, uh, but for many of the reasons that were mentioned um, during the hearing, some of the concerns brought up by the committee, we also share those concerns and are in opposition to the bill as it is written. Um, but we have reached out to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Lieutenant Governor's Office and we look forward to working with them as well as the Secretary of State's Office on finding a solution. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in opposition? Anyone in Las Vegas? Not seeing anyone in La Las Vegas. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line? Callers, if you would like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill AB 114, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Callers, if you'd like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 14, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to participate at this time. Thank you. I will close opposition and open it up for testimony in neutral. If there's anyone that would like to testify in neutral, please approach. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Warren Hardy today representing the Urban Consortium, which is made up of the cities of Reno, Sparks, Las Vegas, and Henderson. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Secretary of State and Lieutenant Governor for the manner in which they proceeded on this and uh, been open to listening to our concerns. I do agree with the Secretary of State that this is a, I think his quote was, direction we need to move in immediately. Uh, I, d I don't disagree with that. Um, this is something, you know, as local governments, we compete to be the most business friendly. This is another step in that direction. <clears throat> I also particularly want to thank the Secretary of State for recognizing, and the Lieutenant Governor, for recognizing the challenges we have with Silver Flume. When this legislation first came forward as, a, as sort of an option in 2015, the local governments that I represent uh, upgraded their systems and uh, at this point I think are ready to plug into this type of a system. 
Um, I will say uh, that we're very grateful to the Secretary of State for their willingness to work with us. They've made it very clear that local governments will be an integral part of this. But we also want to just remind the committee and, and everybody involved that we really need state agencies to be involved in this as well with, with the upgrade and the, the improvements to Silver Flume, Flume because that's where the breakdown happens most often in our, in our experience. Um, I, I will just say briefly that Assemblywoman Newby really hit on some of our I issues and, and, and again, we're, we're not opposed to the bill as written, which is why I'm here in neutral, but the focus on the issues that Assemblywoman Newby brought up are very, very important to us. You know, we really have two different focuses at the state level and the local level. State level sort of business licensing focuses on the who. You know, do you have a license? Are you appropriately categorized? Local governments have to concern ourselves with the where, the how, we have to look at, do these businesses meet the requirements for zoning? Are they special use permits? Are they special limited licensing? These are all the s sorts of things we have to look at. So we really look forward to working with the, the working committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. And that is H-A-R-D-Y for the record? Okay. Anyone else in neutral for Assembly Bill 14? Is there anyone in Las Vegas in neutral for Assembly Bill 14? Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line? If you would like to testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 14, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to participate at this time. Okay, thank you. I'd like to welcome Lieutenant Governor Anthony and Secretary of State Aguilar back up to um, the table to make some final remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Stavros Anthony, Nevada Lieutenant Governor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, the chair and the entire committee for, uh, for having us here this morning and listening to uh, our testimony on AB 14. And I very much appreciate what I heard from uh, uh, the other folks testifying on this bill. Um, I, I think what we're really trying to do here, uh, if AB 14 passes, it, in, in our mind, um, what we're trying to do is we want to help small businesses open, grow, prosper, put people to work. Uh, and, we, and we as a state want to be a partner with local governments and chambers uh, to help do that. We want to be a part of the solution. Um, obviously, the uh, the big question will be um, what can Silver Flume uh, do in the Secretary of State's office once they start working on it. And uh, I guess in my mind, if I, if I think it can do uh, uh, 10 things, maybe it can only do five. But maybe those five are going to help small businesses open and grow and prosper. So that's kind of going to be the great experiment. And uh, um, even though it's, it's obviously in the Secretary of State's office, I'm going to be there with him 100% making sure that this is successful and we absolutely want to work uh, with with businesses and chambers and local governments to make sure that we are part of the solution. We're not causing more problems. So um, thank you for your time and uh, I look forward to speaking to you in the future. Cisco Aguilar for the record. Thank you for your time today and thank you for listening to us. As the Lieutenant Governor said, we're here to work on this together to bring all the concerned parties to the table, figure out what these issues are, and then figure out what the solution is driving forward for our business community. Our business community, as the Lieutenant Governor said, is critical to the success of our state, and we need to be sure that we're there for them and doing what we need to be doing as government. We don't need to be in their way. We need to be allowing them to do what they do well, and that's run their business. So I'm excited to work with the local governments. I'm excited to work with everybody that came to the table today to figure out a solution. I also want to thank everybody for recognizing the challenges we have with Silver Flume. We're working every day to ensure that system works, and unfortunately sometimes it doesn't. But we're coming to you with the solution soon, and we're excited about it because with the functionality of a Silver Flume as it should be, we'll be able to do great things for our businesses and for our state, and look forward to answering any more questions in the future. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Thank you so much, and it's been an honor to have you both here presenting, especially together. So thank you for that. With that, I will go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 14. Our next bill on the agenda is Assembly Bill 55. So I would, Assembly Bill 55 
revises provisions related to unclaimed property. So we have Treasurer Zach Conine who will be presenting today. Treasurer, is there anyone, I feel like it's like executive day in uh, the assembly. Are, are you presenting alone, Treasurer? Uh, no, ma'am, we're joined by our Deputy Treasurer for Unclaimed Property, Danielle Anthony, who is with us in Las Vegas. Excellent. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes to get settled, and then whenever you're ready, you may proceed. Chair, we are ready. Good morning, Chair and Committee members. For the record, I am Treasurer Zach Conine. It's my pleasure to be here this morning to present to you AB 55. Broadly, AB 55 makes various changes to Nevada's unclaimed property laws, which follow national best practices that will help us to modernize and align our governing statutes here in Nevada. Our team has put together a conceptual amendment, which has been provided as an exhibit on Nellis, and we will work with LCB for their final language. As a little bit of background, pursuant to NRS 120A, the Treasurer's Office administers Nevada's unclaimed property program. In this role, the office takes custody of lost or abandoned property from individual and business holders uh, and works to reunite it with its rightful owners. When the property cannot be reunited with the rightful owner, it is held in perpetuity by the state. When you have a moment, uh, I would encourage everyone to search for themselves at, I'm actually not going to give you this web address until the end because I will lose most of you. Um, <laughs> but it takes just a minute to search, uh, and that's something for you all to look forward to. For scope, last uh, fiscal year, our office processed and approved 37,290 claims, which resulted in a return of $42 million. On the holder side, last fiscal year, holders reported and remitted over $83 million in unclaimed property to our office. Since uh, I took office in January of 2019, we have returned more than $188 million in unclaimed property, a record for any four-year period in state history, uh, and it's not close. Um, bill overview, unless there's any questions, Chair, at this stage, I'll walk through the bill. Yes, please proceed through the entire bill, and then we'll ask questions at the end. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sections 2, 4, 6, 14, and 15 of the bill make necessary cleanup changes, such as ensuring continuity in definitions and updating references to other sections that are being changed. Section 7 of the bill makes various changes to the section of our statute that outlines what kind of property needs to be reported and when that reporting must happen. These changes are technical in nature and are designed to help clarify many of the more nuanced questions that we arise uh, in our holder and audit working groups related to specific industries such as insurance, retirement, and pre-need funeral services contracts. Section 8 of the bill clarifies the presumed abandoned date for gift certificates and removes a piece of existing statute that makes the owner's last known address for gift certificates the state treasurer's office in Carson City. This has created a different standard among property types, and we'd like to ensure they're all property aligned and reported in the same manner. Section 9 makes updates as to how and what a holder of unclaimed property should report to our office. Section 10 and 11 replace requirements that our office purchase print ads. We found that earned media receives a much greater response than publishing ads in the newspaper. We've also adopted an active return model, seeking out Nevadans to return their unclaimed property as opposed to requiring them to come to us. The updated language still requires the Treasurer's Office to provide notice in the form of a press release and through the publishing of a public notice, both of which we believe fulfill the spirit of the existing requirements without mandating the expenditure of advertising dollars. I would note, while this update does not mandate the purchase of advertisements, it does allow the option if the office chooses to. For example, targeted digital ads, geofenced ads at events such as career fairs, uh, and other things. <laughs> Section 12 allows the office to accept property prior to it being deemed in statute uh, if the office believes to be in the best interest of the state. This happens most often when a business dissolves or is going through a bankruptcy period. Uh, there's a period of time after the property is deemed uh, lost, right, uh, before it can be handed over to the office, and sometimes that's not in the best interest of Nevadans. And Section 13 updates existing law to allow our office the opportunity to seek records from other state and local agencies that would otherwise be deemed confidential. For a bit of background here, this is the, the largest piece of the bill. When the pandemic began, our office began looking for ways we could assist Nevadans who were hardest hit and were struggling. We teamed up with Dieter to use our unemployment insurance claimant list to cross-reference our unclaimed property database to determine if we were holding any unclaimed property for UI claimants. We were able to find more than $10.2 million owed to individuals who had filed for unemployment in unclaimed property. And we were able to return over 2.3 million of it. However, the statutes did not allow us to just send folks checks. We had to contact them and then get them to reach out to our office. Even though we had 
databases matching on their names, birth date, social security number, and addresses. To remedy this, in 2021, our office ran Senate Bill 71, which was passed and signed by Governor Sisolak. Senate Bill 71 allows the Treasurer's Office to initiate a claim on a property owner's behalf, allowing for a greater level of efficiency when returning on claimed property. When we began seeking out additional opportunities to expand these initiatives, we quickly ran into another issue, uh, as is the nature of government. Uh, much of the information held by state and local agencies are, rightfully so, deemed confidential. The section of the bill gives the Treasurer's Office the ability to receive these records despite their confidential nature to the public. For instance, imagine if we could automatically match individuals who held a teaching license in Nevada with their unclaimed property, individuals who had filed for SNAP benefits or WIC benefits with their unclaimed property, individuals who were receiving payments from the opioid settlements with their unclaimed property. Right? This will speed up the process of returning that money to Nevadans, and since it is Nevadans, uh, we think that's important. Section 3 and 5 uh, will be removed through the proposed amendment that should be on Nellis. And Section 16 repeals an existing section of NRS 120 uh, that defers any question of law to the Uniformed Unclaimed Property Act. Uh, we're seeking to repeal this for two reasons. First, the Uniform Unclaimed Property Act, the specific uniform law which is cited, has since been updated and will likely be updated again in the future. Thus, the statutory reference is outdated. More importantly, there are sections of uniform law, both the current and previous ones, that are incongruent with Nevada's legal framework and are thus in conflict. Uh, this concludes our presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Treasurer. Members, do we have any questions? Our first question is from Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, in Section 3, I noticed in the conceptual amendment, it's, it's scheduled to be struck uh, regarding loyalty card. Could you just give a little background on why? Uh, Treasurer Conan, for the record, um, we appreciate our relationships with the business community. We're always happy when groups like the Chamber uh, reach out and express concerns um, that they have with the bill. And in this case, and I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves, but in this case, the concept of a loyalty card was so um, is so nebulous, right? When we look at the differences between, say, a casino loyalty card or a McDonald's loyalty card, or Starbucks loyalty card, they all have different values. But generally, within uh, the terms of service of those agreements, those loyalty points from a cash value are worth almost nothing. And so turning them over to the state, we believe, um, a, wouldn't really accomplish what we were going for, which is turning over items of value to then be returned um, to Nevadans. It would result in a bunch of 17 cent uh, accounts um, because I no longer you know, have access to my points at Starbucks. Thank you for your question, Assemblywoman. Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Treasurer, for this uh, great presentation. Just a quick question on Section 13. I know it lists the last known address. Um, have you all discussed what would happen if the last known address is, is not correct anymore? So if we sent the money but the person doesn't live there? Treasurer Conine, for the record. So we deal with this quite a bit, um, where someone is requesting money but has moved addresses. And our team has a relatively robust process um, through which we make sure that the money is going to the right place. In the case where we would be actively sending a check, one of the benefits that we have being in the state treasury is we know where all payments are going to anyone receiving a payment by the state. And so generally, uh, if someone moves addresses and they're receiving some sort of social service or they have a license or they have a whatever, they update that address and so we'll have the most recent information. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Consendine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for this presentation. I was glad to hear you're looking at connecting social services with people who um, might have unclaimed um, money. But my question attached to that is, is have you considered or thought about the possibility that there might be a small amount of money for someone who is applying for social services, but that small amount of money might kick them off social services and how those two conflicts could be resolved? Uh, Treasurer Conine, for the record, um, we haven't uh, considered that directly, but we work in similar circumstances with both the IDA program and the ABLE program, right, where we're conscious as to that. And I think um, it's, a, it's a really good flag and one we would have to think through. Functionally, if these dollars are from a paycheck or from something else, um, they've already theoretically been accounted for on that individual's um, tax situation, right? If it's a paycheck that was lost or a deposit or something else, it doesn't count as income. 
Um, so for the most part, they should be all right on that front. On the asset side, right, um, that's where we'd want to make sure we're working with those groups to make to perhaps put a flag on the amount of money, reach out to them, make sure that they either have an IDA or an ABLE account or some other um, way to take in those funds without causing them a kerfluffle. Thank you for that. But we, have we gotten kerfuckle? Fluckle? <laughs> kerfluckle? See, I, I can't even say it on the record twice today. Actually, can we scratch both of them off the record today? Um, Good thing my mom's not watching Nellis today, right? <laughs> See, I can't even say it. Uh, too many syllables. But Assemblywoman Gallant has a question for us. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. So one of the things I saw during the pandemic was a lot of um, fraud going on with the unemployment checks. And uh, personally, what I was seeing was a lot of my tenants, their um, mailboxes were getting broken into. Um, and it was sort of like an organized ring where they would, these groups would target um, vulnerable people and then they would just take their unemployment check and almost move into their house and there was nothing they could do. So um, I'm not saying this is happening with everyone, but how are you guys going to handle situations like that? Because um, I fought real hard to advocate. We were even like trying to report this to the authorities and got zero response. Uh, Treasurer Conine, for the record, thanks for the question. Uh, unfortunately, like many other state agencies, we receive fraudulent attempts and unclaimed property, which our team um, sifts through and makes sure that the money is going to where it needs to be. I, you know, a, a lot of unclaimed property um, is in uh, is is owed to our elder population. Our elder population is generally uh, more likely to be the victim of identity fraud and the rest. And so we have tools in place to get that done. Um, but it is a real problem, and it's something that we'd have to keep an eye out for, just like we do now. Okay, thank you for that. Not seeing any additional questions. We can move into testimony. So anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 55, please approach. Oh, I've already, that's fine. Okay, not seeing anyone in Carson City. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 55? Okay, is it broadcasting? Uh, please open the lines. Is there anyone on the line that would like to testify in support for Assembly Bill 55? Callers, if you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 55, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to participate at this time. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone that would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 55? Anyone in Las Vegas? Anyone on the lines that would like to testify in opposition? Callers, if you would like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 55, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to participate at this time. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone that would like to testify in neutral? Please approach. Again, you will have two minutes. Please make sure you state your name and spell it clearly for the record. Tanya Brown, spelled T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N. In section 9, subsection 10, it says if the property presumed abandoned is in the form of stocks, equity, retirement accounts, virtual currency, and the property is valued at 1000 or more, the, the holder of the property shall send a written notice required by subsection 9 in the form of, the, of certified mail. What it doesn't include is oil royalties. Oil royalties will go back for decades, generations and be deposited into the unclaimed properties. And boy, you get a nice little surprise when you get several thousand dollars. But, um, and a lot of this is inherited and broken out into the families. So I think uh, oil royalty should be included in number 10. 
because uh, I do know of others that um, do have um, oil royalties and they have not been contacted. Um, and like I said, we, we've had this in the, my husband's family for decades. They reserved, they sold property, retained the mineral rights back in the 50s and lived off of the oil royalties for many, many years. And when the grandmother died, uh, the mother and the children, six, got to split and then the royalties. And so it does amount to quite a bit of money at times, but it's stuck in the unclaimed properties. And then there are times where the company will change its name and you have no way of knowing. We have direct deposit, but there, that's not where the major money comes from. It goes into the unclaimed properties. And then it's like, oh, surprise, you got several thousand dollars and then, you know, that's your share. So I'm just saying I would like to see that added to it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Connor Kane with Kerr Nevada, testifying on behalf of the Nevada Bankers Association. And uh, to avoid any, any further kerfuffle this morning, I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, Personal we, attack. <laughs> 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 um, we, we appreciate the Treasurer and his team working with us and other stakeholders to tailor the revised Uniform Unclaimed Property Act in Nevada's existing frame, legal framework, as the Treasurer mentioned, um, and, and are committed to continuing to work with him uh, in his office. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in Carson City that would like to testify in neutral? Anyone in Las Vegas to testify in neutral? Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line that would like to testify in neutral? Callers, if you would like to testify in neutral for Assembly Bill 55, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to participate at this time. Okay, I would close testimony. I'd like to welcome Treasurer Conine back up for your final remarks. Thank you, Chair Treasurer Conine, for the record. Uh, appreciate the opportunity again to present this bill to the committee. Um, I would also like to let you all know that seven of you have unclaimed property for a total value of $4,275. Um, happy to go through the individuals, uh, but some of you are doing quite well. Um, for anyone else, the website to search is claimitnevada.org. That's claimitnevada.org. Tell your friends. Uh, we have missed Valentine's Day, but there are other holidays approaching. Treasurer, does that include my unclaimed property that I applied for? I believe it was seventeen dollars. Uh, Chair, it does, but there's actually a little bit more unclaimed property for you. You should check again. <laughs> I, I will, because I'm still waiting for my seventeen dollars. So, okay. Perfect. We'll lump them together. For you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. With that, I will um, close the hearing on Assembly Bill 55. Our last bill for the day is Assembly Bill 67. And Assembly Bill 67 creates the fund for the compensation of victims of security fraud. And with that, we would like to welcome back our Secretary of State Aguilar to present Assembly Bill 67. Please pre proceed when you're ready. And make sure that you state, your state and spell your names for the record, please. Good morning again, Chair Miller and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Cisco Aguilar, Secretary of State. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm joined by Deputy Secretary of Securities, Aaron Houston. We are here today to give you a brief overview of the Secretary of State's office and its role in the business community in Nevada. The Office of the Secretary of State is one of the original constitutional offices established in the Nevada Constitution. It is responsible for maintaining official records of the acts of the legislature and the executive branch. Over time, additional duties have been developed. Some are well known, such as being Chief Officer of Elections and Register of Business Entity Filings. 
Some are less known, such as the administration and enforcement of the Uniform Securities Act, our role in administering the notary chapter, Nevada lockbox program, document preparation services, domestic partnerships, and the business portal. The Office of the Secretary of State is officially organized into eight divisions, securities, commercial recordings, elections, notary, special projects, which include managing document preparation services, domestic partnerships, Nevada lockbox, the business portal, executive administration, and operations division. Additionally, as part of the Elections Integrity Task Force, we work closely with many other law enforcement agencies at the federal, state, and county levels. Our offices are located in Carson City and in North Las Vegas. And as I mentioned, I have a great deputy with me here today, Aaron Houston, who's going to finish the rest of the presentation. Good morning, Aaron Houston, um, for the record. I'm the Deputy Secretary of State for Securities. And we are here today to talk about the Securities Division and its responsibilities. Um, NRS 90 is the Nevada Securities Act, which is where Nevada has adopted and codified the Uniform Securities Act, which is a version that has been adopted in all 50 states. The Nevada, Nevada Commodities Act is found in NRS 91. That's utilized a lot less frequently. Uh, most of what we deal with is in NRS 90. The main function of the Nevada Securities Act is to protect Nevada investors by licensing the professionals who recommend investment products, who provide advice about which investment products to buy, and to register the investment products themselves in order to provide a mechanism for the everyday investor to learn more about the company into which they are investing. NRS 9570 and NRS 9590 also prohibit fraud in connection with the sale of a security. Every violation of NRS 90 is a Category B felony. The Securities Division is made up of three main sections. The Registration and Licensing team handles applications for licensing from broker-dealers, investment advisors, and for licensing of the securities themselves. Many securities that are sold in Nevada are exempt from licensing based on a federal exemption scheme. However, there are lots of securities that are considered intrastate offerings, and those can be sold to anyone at any income level. The securities registration process is very straightforward. The second division is our examination section. That division is responsible for conducting um, inspections of Nevada-based broker-dealer branch offices and Nevada-based investment advisor firms. We have six full-time employees and one part-time employee in our examination team. Sorry, I'm on the right side. Our third division is the criminal investigations section. We have seven post-certified peace officers who investigate criminal violations of NRS 90, which is most often fraudulent offerings. Unfortunately, the most common area where we see fraud is in unregistered securities known as private placements. Here is an example of a common scenario. An individual with a very low net worth is enticed to invest in a new startup with a promise of a high rate of interest as a return. Unfortunately, the offer itself was premised on false statements or misleading information. When the investment fails, the individual is completely out of luck in terms of recouping their money. When that happens, our investigations recommend a charge of securities fraud against the bad actor. Those cases are prosecuted by the Office of the Attorney General in conjunction with our investigation. When those, uh, when those cases result in a guilty verdict, restitution is often included as part of the overall sentence for the guilty party. This brings us to AB 67, which proposes to establish a victim's restitution fund for victims of securities fraud. The Nevada Constitution provides for restitution to victims of a crime. However, many guilty parties in securities cases have no money left in which to make their victims whole. AB 67 aims to fill that gap. AB 67 creates a fund out of monies received as penalties from administrative orders arising from violations of NRS 90, which is the Uniform Securities Act. Nevada residents who are victims of securities fraud and for whom an award of restitution has been made in a criminal adjudication can then apply for a small amount of rec recompense from the rest restitution fund. Most victims of securities fraud receive very little or no money back from their original investment. The main reason we are proposing the leg this legislation is that it provides a way for Nevada residents to obtain desperately needed relief after losing what often is a significant chunk of their savings to someone who has defrauded them. Often, victims of securities fraud are in the most vulnerable communities. 
especially our senior communities and other adults who live on fixed incomes. Due to bad actors, they can lose their life savings. This bill aims to help get them back on their feet. Most of the time, there is no money left for the victim after the fraudster has taken their money. Even if the victim successfully sues in civil court, there is no money left to satisfy the victim's judgment. This legislation is based on a 2021 NASA model rule. NASA is the North American Securities Administrators Association. NASA considered feedback from state securities regulators, trade associations representing broker dealers and investment advisors, and bar associations representing attorneys for public investors. AB 67 proposes to divert a fractional amount of revenue from that presently goes to the general fund, pursuant to NRS 9800, to a separate fund held for victims of securities fraud. In the past, the Securities Division has received close to 200000 per year through enforcement actions alone. Only victims who have been awarded restitution as set forth in NRS 9640 could apply for relief from the fund. Under AB 67, applicants who have been awarded restitution for a criminal conviction can apply for repayment through monies collected in this fund up to a maximum of $25,000. Of note, up until a few years ago, the revenue in consideration today was maintained within the Securities Division to be used by the Securities Division. Before we finish, I want to point out that the revenue from the enforcement actions is a very small percentage of the revenue earned from the Securities Division. Erin does a great job with her team. The Securities Division has brought over $30 million each year for the last three fiscal years. Fiscal year 22, over $35 million. Chair Miller, thank you so much for inviting me to present AB 67 to the committee today, and I hope the committee will support the measure. I am happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you for your presentation. I do believe there'll be a few questions. Our first question is from Assemblywoman Constantine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for this um, presentation and thank you for creating this fund. I just want to make sure I'm clear uh, in my understanding that um, Someone harmed can apply for the lesser of $25,000 or 25% of the restitution awarded by the court. But then in uh, the next step would be that the state of Nevada has subrogation rights and that they can then go after that bad actor for the remaining restitution. And does that money then go back into this fund? It doesn't go to the original person? Aaron Houston, for the record, thank you for the question. That's a great question. Uh, my, my, it, it should be going directly to the state. So if they, if the fund has already paid out funds of $25,000, which is the maximum, and then the state is able to then re recoup those monies, that will then go directly to the state general fund. Yes, you may follow up. Thank you, Chair. Um, so then if somebody in this situation has a choice to either apply to get the 25000 or up to 25% of the restitution um, to get their money, I guess, quicker and less expensive than, they, than if they took the time to get their own attorney to fight for, to get the balance of that restitution. Is that right? That's correct. Or, or what may, Aaron Houston, for the record, my apologies. What may also happen is that there may be a um, civil judgment and they are able to satisfy that judgment through collection efforts down the line. Again, that money won't then go, um, that will go to the general fund if the state's able to recoup it or if the victim receives funds themselves, then the, they could be required to repay the victim's restitution fund. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this presentation. Uh, so along a similar line, um, you had mentioned when presenting about the application, and in Section 3, it also says the administrator or his or her designee shall review um, the applications. Can you talk about what you think the application will be like and why it's an administrator or designee versus a board? Aaron Houston, for the record, thank you for the question. Um, that language is from the NASA model rule. 
it, it could be changed if that is de you know, deemed appropriate or in the best interest of the state. I will say that the reason it is drafted the way that it is is because the administrator is usually the person at the top of the securities division who is most familiar with the facts and facets of each case as they come through and may have the best understanding of possibility of future repayment to victims or payment efforts in the past. Our next question is from Vice Chair Marzola. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. My question has to do with slide 15. Can you tell me what that fractional amount is? Erin Houston, for the record, yes, thank you for the question. So the fractional amount is the whatever the Securities Division is able to recover through enforcement actions, which through the years, the last three years, has averaged $200,000 a year. And we say fractional because <coughs> it is such a tiny amount of what the Securities Division brings in overall through registration and licensing fees, which the bulk of that is from broker-dealer um, sales representatives who are registering in the state. So the $200,000 it is something that is fluid and will change every year, but based on enforcement actions, based on the way the bill is drafted now. Follow-up, Chair? Yes, please. Thank you. And so my second question is, um, how did you come up with a $25,000 maximum? Aaron Houston, for the record, uh, that is suggested language from the NASA model rule, which we agreed with because for the reason that we believe that $25,000 is a fair significant portion that will help everyday investors get back on their feet, although it will not deplete the fund overall. So we're trying to spread the wealth, as it were, <laughs> and we believe that that's a, a number that represents that, that um, effort well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Assemblywoman Hardy? Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm glad to see some legislation coming forward like this. As you uh, mentioned in your presentation, a lot of these victims are seniors. They're vulnerable and get caught up in things and, you know, spend their life savings, and then they don't know what to do. So kind of two questions, and this one you may not have an answer. Do you have any idea of an estimate of possibly how many people this could help? And then uh, the second one, again, pertaining to, say, seniors, how would they – how do you plan to let them know about this? Is it something um, they would be aware of, you know, after a court proceeding or, you know, a lot of them don't have access to internet and things like that. So how would they know to even be able to apply for this? Here in Houston, for the record, thank you for those questions. Uh, as to the first question, I, it's difficult to put a number on how many people may be able to avail themselves of this fund. I would say on average 20 to 30 people a year our victims, we receive an average of six to seven complaints every single month. Um, those do not all result in a criminal conviction or even an enforcement action. So parsing through those numbers, I would say two to three per month, perhaps. Um, keep in mind that it's there is a criminal conviction component part of this. So in terms of how often this goes all the way through and we get a conviction through the criminal court, that part is um, also involves the attorney general's office as they prosecute our, our cases for the most part. Sometimes the district attorney does as well, depending on what county we're in. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And then the second question, can you remind me what the second question is? I'm so sorry. Yeah, just how, how do you see um, letting people know that this is available? Erin Houston, for the record, we do plan on engaging in a significant amount of outreach and to that end, we also are in the trenches with the individuals who are the victims of securities fraud. So it's my opinion and hope that we would be able to work with them directly as they're moving through the process. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one re uh, is Section 3, and it says the administrator may waive. So the administrator is going to be the arbiter of how these applications are received. Is there an appeal, and, and to whom? And the second question would be, um, 
if someone is applying for these funds, does there have to be a criminal conviction first before they are eligible to receive the funds? Thank you. Aaron Houston, for the record, thank you. Those are both really great questions. In terms of an appeal process, there is not one established within the statute itself, although that is something that could be addressed in the administrative code process. Um, there is mention of uh, promulgating rules to make this program eff efficient and effective, and that is something that we could consider for the administrative rule. Um, in terms of who that would be appealed to, that's, I don't, I don't, I'd have to get back to you with the answer to that. The second part of the question, we, um, I'm sorry, can you remind me what it is again? I'm so sorry. That's just fine. I There's flew at four, five o'clock this morning, so. <laughs> I've taken that flight. I get it. Um, uh, the second question was, does there have to be a criminal conviction oh, right. before funds will be dispersed? Erin Houston, for the record. The way the, the rule is drafted now, there is no requirement for a criminal conviction. It can be restitution as ordered from the securities di division pursuant to NRS 9640. Although um, I think the spirit of the, of the fund is to allow for restitution through criminal convictions. That being said, can it also be through a civil judgment? Because we're hearing both terms during the presentation. So we're just trying to figure what um, justifies or authenticates the, the reasoning for the actual award. So is it just the, a, a criminal conviction and or a civil judgment? Aaron Houston, for the record. Yes, exactly. It can be civil. It can, pursuant to 640, NRS 9640 allows for restitution to be determined through a criminal action, civil action, or through an administrative action from the Securities Division as well. Thank you. And, and with that, because I know there's been a number of questions and my colleague already asked one of them, but could you just walk us through, I, I guess, the process. So from the, uh, I shouldn't say the process. Um, so there's been a civil or an administrative or criminal judgment. So that will determine that the victim qualifies for an award. But then it also said um, up to 25%, I'm sorry, I just, um, up to 25% and for a certain judgment. And so if I, I'm interested in how then will the office determine how much of an award to award out to each individual? Because I appreciate that you're following national standards for up to 25,000 and the reasoning behind that. And I think I heard something mentioned about a percent, but what will be your process in determining? And again, you're saying, oh, six to seven victims a, a month. But what if once this, you know, sometimes the nature of being present attracts um, more. So if now once this is publicized, people are aware of this, and now we start seeing that we have victims turning out at 30, 40 a month applying, how will you determine how much and whom to award? Erin Houston, for the record, thank you for the question. That will be difficult, of course, but the intention is to award the maximum amount for each victim until the fund is depleted. So I know other states have uh, gone back to the legislature and attempted to change the funding source or up to, to up the amount that they could include within their um, d to divert into this fund. But it, it, really the the intent is to award the maximum to each victim until the fund is depleted. And when you say depleted, do you mean that month or for that biennial cycle? It, is it just when it's gone, it's gone and... Aaron Houston, for the record, correct, right. Since, it's, since these are based on enforcement action funds, we don't have a definitive funding source that guarantees that there will be a certain amount of monies available or revenue that's put into that fund at any given time. We also don't want to get into the practice of engaging in enforcement actions for the purpose of funding the fund. So it, it really would be whoever first come, first serve funding or 
providing recompense to the maximum amount available, which won't always be $25,000. It's 25% or $25,000 up to a maximum of 25. So if somebody only invests $10,000 and they have a small civil judgment and we are able to help just in a small way, then hopefully that will, we'll see some applications with those uh, numbers as well. But we do hope to use up the monies in the fund as frequently as we can. Thank you, and I also appreciate your respect for um, sometimes in fee income situations of not trying to just generate more fees by applying more um, fictions, yes. Uh, we have another question from Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so often in legislation we see a paragraph saying that the administrator can seek, fun can seek gifts or grants, that type of thing. And I'm somewhat surprised to see that that's not in here. Is that something uh, that was purposefully left out, or is that something you'd be willing to add? Cisco Aguilar, for the record, definitely an option, especially with a lot of our brokerage houses presence in Nevada. They see these this as an issue, and to build credibility with their investor groups or with the investor community, I think this is a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So. <laughs> With that, I will go ahead and open it up for testimony and support of Assembly Bill, what are we on, 67. So if there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 67, please approach. Not seeing anyone. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support? Broadcasting, is there anyone in on the lines that would like to testify in support? Callers, if you would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 67, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller, you are unmuted. Good morning, Cyrus Hojoni, C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. I'm very glad this bill has been forward. Uh, the fact that there's just so much criminality in the securities industry, deception, lies, especially on Wall Street, uh, this is a good step forward. Uh, and I just really learned a lot how it targets seniors, and I think it's very important, even though I'm 30 years old and I have about... 12 or more years investing in the stock market. I really wish you guys can do more also about home loans, considering we had a horrible crisis about 15 years ago, because that's very important. There's just so much scams and ripoffs in the financial industry. Uh, we'd like to thank all of you for bringing this bill forward, and thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Veronica Constantine, sorry to mispronounce your name, uh, regarding this issue. And sorry about the outside noise I'm driving right now. Thank you, caller. Next caller. Chair, there are no other callers to provide testimony. Thank you. I'd like it to open it up for testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 67. If there's anyone here that would like to testify in opposition? Not seeing anyone here in Carson City. Is there anyone in Las Vegas? There's no one in Las Vegas. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the lines? If you would like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 67, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to participate at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in neutral? There's no one here in Carson City that would like to testify in neutral. Is there anyone in Las Vegas? Not seeing anyone approach in Las Vegas broadcasting. Is there anyone on the line? Callers, if you would like to testify in neutral for Assembly Bill 67, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to participate at this time. Thank you so much. So with that, Secretary of State, if you would like to um, 
approach and make your final remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Miller and the committee, Cisco Aguilar for the record. Thank you for your time today to hear this bill. This is pretty important, especially when we talk about the investments of our community members. These investments are supposed to provide for these individuals for the future so they can live a life that is comfortable. They've worked hard for this money and for somebody to come by and take it from them is unacceptable and we need to stand up and give these people an opportunity to have restitution. So thank you for your time. Deputy Houston is an incredible advocate for our investor community. I'm grateful to have her on the team. She's been one of the most fascinating areas within state government that I've found, given the work that they do, and they do it quietly. So thank you. Erin Houston, I, I just want to thank everyone for your time this morning, and thank you for letting us pre present on AB 67. I hope you'll consider adopting it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And with that, I will go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 67. Thank you so much. With that, we will move on to our final agenda item, which is public comment. We ask that anyone um, making public comment today make sure that those comments are to topics that are under the purview of this committee, but not in regards to any bill that's already had a hearing. So with that, is there anyone that would like to make public comment here in Carson City. Again, you will have up to two minutes and we ask that you say and spell your name for the record. Tanya Brown, T-O-N-J-A-B-R-O-W-N, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I think um, today I would like to read something to you and I think it's better well coming from the person who can say this the best. Okay, um, I'm just going to a uh, few little snippets and then that'll be it, but you'll get it tomorrow for Assembly Bill 49 and our proposed amendment. Uh, when I first got to prison, I realized that if this could happen to me, it could happen to anyone, including family or other loved ones. I went to work in the prison law library, then took a couple of years in law through correspondence courses, as well as some offered by the state college system at the prison, and learned through research it that it didn't have to happen. If you know the law and how it works, even a person with a public defender that doesn't give a crap about you or your case, you can guide the defense or otherwise protect your rights. So I took the case into my own hands and started from there. Over the years, I have watched this pattern through my case and numerous others and have come to the reality that state elected courts never seem to address the important issues when you are acting on your own, but instead choose one minor issue and dismiss the case rather than decide the major issues that are crying for resolution. So because I will not sway from the fact that I didn't commit this crime, I will never be released from prison. I just will not say that I did this crime when I know I did not, nor should I have to in order to be released. Nonetheless, if that means that I will spend the rest of my natural life in prison, so be it. The simple truth is, that because the judicial system in Nevada as well as the pro board are motivated by what is politically favorable rather than what is right, guilt or innocence is totally irrelevant to the process itself. The American public wants criminals in jail because they are afraid of being afraid of the streets and tired of being victims. That fear causes the elected prosecutors to be entirely motiva motivated to make certain for that every crime there is a criminal. As such, I feel the need to say I need to face the reality that I will spend the rest of my life in prison for tomorrow that I, for a crime I did commit, whether I, my life ends tomorrow by the act of another or in 20 years from natural causes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Not seeing anyone else here in Carson City. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to make public comment? Not seeing anyone in Las Vegas broadcasting, please open the lines for anyone that would like to make public comment. Callers, if you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. again. I just wanted to point out that I'm not very satisfied that the complicate or so we've had that is so dependent on low interest rates. 
Uh, and right now I'm driving by a lot of construction sites, so I can all these boom and bust cycles. This is very, very important in our everyday lives, in our everyday finances. And I think that if we want to create a stable financial system, we're going to have to control the financial system and mainly interest rates. So many of our economic elements, especially here in Las Vegas, depends on low interest rates. This was the cover-up that boosted the crisis that we had about 10, 15 years ago. In other words, we didn't really structurally improve the system. We basically just covered it up. And if we are seeing interest rates rise now, it's really starting to shake a lot of things up, namely the stock market, housing sales, and et cetera. And I really would wish that more of us would raise an alarm regarding this issue. I yield my time. Thank you, caller. Next caller. Ian Murray Grant, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent, A-N-N-E-M-A-R-I-E-G-R-A-N-T. The re recent focus on innocence has produced hundreds of exonerations, although these exonerations have begun to reveal the causes of wrongful convictions and have inspired needed reforms to the criminal justice system. Much work remains to be done. An infrequently recognized facet of this movement is the posthumous exoneration that demonstrates an increasing recognition that even where justice comes too late for the individual defendant, the act of exonerating the wrongfully convicted has benefits that extend far beyond the individual. These frequently intangible but nonetheless considerable benefits flow to the defendant's family, the victim, and the larger community. Because the physical release of the defendant is no longer at issue, posthumous exonerations are prime opportunities for courts to make a broader inquiry into the cases of wrongful convictions. Legislatures should provide an avenue to posthumous exonerations in courts in order to provide related justice to families, victims, and communities. Posthumous exonerations can teach us lessons that must not be lost long after today's innocent defendants are dead. Their ordeals can help others avoid the same fate. I'd like to mention with the public records request being made in Nevada, exculpatory evidence is being found. I am asking you to support our amendment to AB 49, adding posthumous exoneration language to AB 49, which is being presented tomorrow, 2223. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Here, there are no other callers to participate at this time. Thank you. And with that, um, I will go ahead and close public comment. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to the members uh, for today. With that, we have finished our business. We will meet tomorrow at 8 a.m. This meeting is adjourned.